Ah, the harbour. I always loved watching the boats come in and out. <laughs> Never did get around to expand in the fishing exhibit, did I? <laughs> you remember coming down here with me? I'd have liked it better if you'd have let me swim. I love your confidence, Sparky. But you always thought yourself a bigger dog than you actually were. Oh, lots more boats than there used to be, though, aren't there? Certainly are. Shelmerston got busy. Though this is busier than even I remember. Say, how long have we been doing this search? Oh, I don't know, Morris. Once you're dead, time seems to be a bit less important. Does it? Oh, I don't know. I suppose it seems a bit galling that time and everything else keeps moving, even though I've stopped. Makes a man feel... unimportant. Oh, you're not unimportant, Morris. You're saving the island. And to do that, we'd better go find some people who remember Samfire. Yes. Yes. Yes, Sam surely understands the feeling of watching everything change. Fish folk live for what? 200 years? That's no small amount of change. Not volcano change, though, Morris. And that's what we need to avoid. Off we go! I swim with a pod south of the Fire Isles. I believe the Drysiders call the larger one Shelmerston. <gasps> it's where the ceremony happens for the Drysider who stopped the world from cracking. That's where I first heard talk of toast and where I met the friend called Samfire. I did not believe it at first. A food which snaps so dry. <laughs> then one morning at sunup, I followed the ship and caught a blackened slice as it arced into the water. This was the start of my lifelong love of toast. <laughs> I saw Samphire on the dry side and came up out of the sea to ask them for toast. <laughs> they asked me to put on some pants. But I refuse to denigrate myself with dry side fabric. No matter, I had brought some shiny coins with me that I found on the seabed and secreted in my swimming folds. Sam took me to their parents' toast shack, but they refused to serve me without clothes. They also told me that my shiny coins were unsuitable, too old. So, Sam lent me some trousers, and I swept the tow shack in return for crispy slices. <gasps> Sam taught me some of the ways of the dry ciders, <laughs> but to be honest, I'm only interested in the toast. I never wanted to eat anything else. Sam understood this. I spend my nights swimming through the black waters of the deepest ocean trenches. By day, I come up onto Quayside and fill up on the finest crusted seedy boomer, almost black, no butter. Oh, I could really go for a nice piece of toast right now. But, uh, yeah, with butter. But it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of toast on this side. I'm getting 
getting the scent of Grenkins again, Morris. I'll pop up to let you know when we're close to one. When I was a kid, I hated the annual Morlow call. I was kept away and found excuses not to be there. Then, age 10, my dad marched me down to the beach with other men and put a knife in my hand. It was the worst day of my life. I saw Morlow slip from jaw to belly, more blood than you could imagine. I didn't sleep for months after. But you grow up, don't you? I never felt it right that we was killing Morlows, but what could I do about it? I was just a fisherman. One day I see Samfire, the new harbour officer, handing out leaflets on the quayside. Stop that, Col. I went along to that first meeting at the campsite. Greg Litherland was one of the other organisers. It was beautiful. So much hope around that campfire. When I spoke about the pain of the Morlow, it really felt like the young uns were listening. Me, Sam and Greg held regular events to raise funds for badges and patches. I was proud to wear mine on me best Gansey. There was quite a rift between us and the old guard. They felt the ban was an attack on our ways. Sam and me took a load of the fishermen out for a beer and Sam made them listen. They really respected Sam. We got most of them on our side that way. By 87, we finally felt like we had enough support to push for change. So the week before the Morlow showed up, we organised a mass dying on the beach. There were loads of us lying down on that sand. Islanders, fishermen, fish folk all together. And the press showed up and the mainland TV. And for the first time in 500 years, we stopped that call. I'm so glad we don't do that cull anymore. I was proud of Sam and that lot when they finally made the olden see sense. And, well, I did my part. Held a lot of those early meetings at the museum we did. Morlows, such gentle creatures.
By the time Sam started as the Arbor Controller in 79, the fishing industry in Shelmiston was on its arse. No way to compete with those factory trawlers from the mainland, was there? Couldn't moor those things anywhere near the island, even if we had them. Of course we were all smuggling, stands to reason, done it? There was no money, all those old fishing sheds on the quay, the ones the tourists like, were falling down. Old place looked, pardon me, like a tip. It was a lot of trouble at first. Sam trying to stick by the rules and catch us out any way they could, and us trying any which way to give her the runabout. It wasn't easy, mind you. She was smart, that Sam. You never knew when they were going to pop her head out of the water beside your tub. And to be fair to Sam, some of them smuggling boys were bad uns. Worse stuff than booze on some of them boats, and that's the truth. Probably no bad thing Sam put a stop to it. But in time, Sam started to see how things were, how we do things, and we came to an understanding of sorts. If Sam turned a blind eye to a bit of the decent stuff, the armless stuff, then we'd report the worst of it. I mean, we all want to keep the sea safe, stands to reason. Plus, Sam was partial to a bottle or two of the sheep shank on occasion. Oh, yeah. Sam was sharp as a gutting knife. They made us hand over some of the, uh, shall we say, dividends to fix up the key. All them sheds and that. Make them into something we can be proud of. Turn things around for Shelmiston, that did. Now we get more of those tourists since the big ferry started. And they love a day out on a boat. Can takes them all out, he does. At the same time, Sam organised a kind of work-sharing thing with the fish folk. Got some of them to swim along with the fishing boats. Help them locate the biggest shoals. Gave those big trawlers with all their fancy radar gear a run for their money. <laughs> we'll never be big players in the fishing down here. But thanks to Sam, we hold our own. Bless them. I reckon I still have a bottle or two of sheep shank stashed away at the museum. Don't suppose anyone will ever drink them now. A different kind of spirit to the ones we've been looking for.
I first met Sam when I sailed the new ferry, the Queen of the Isles, into harbor. Of course, I'd heard of the fish folk, but I'd never met one. Sam was an amazing pilot, knew the waters better than any boatman. It was strange steering a course for someone actually in the water, but we never went wrong with Sam to guide us in. Next time I was in Chelmerston, we went for a drink at the Camel. I'm more into bats than beer, but Sam was intriguing, and the atmosphere in there was great. Like a warm nest. Great band, too. Awesome sousaphone player. I think we got on because we were both a little bit on the outside of things. Sam invited me over for toast and hot chocolate. Honestly, hot chocolate doesn't do it for me. But the toast, that multi seed bread. Sam made the best toast. I told Sam that next to a good cuttlefish bone, that it was my favorite snack. I stayed over. In the morning, we went for a walk along the beach. And just as the sun was rising, I took them flying on my back. We went up and looked down over the islands. Sam wasn't scared at all. They said it was like swimming through the air. It was on the next trip to Shelmerston. We just sighted land when Sam's head popped out of the water right beside my berth and passed me a fresh cuttlefish bone carved especially for me. When we moved in together, it was the best day of my whole life. I put that cuttlefish bone on my bedside table within big reach. I still look at it every day every single day. <laughs> I, I just remembered that time Blythe and I did a duet at the karaoke. Oh, I can't believe I agreed to it. <sighs> Must have had a few too many. Ah, I never knew how Sam and Blythe met. I used to love finding these on the beach. Ha <laughs> ha 
It was the sixth summer after I spawned that I went to my first Aggie's Day ceremony. You know, Aggie, the dry cider who saved the world from cracking in two. We don't go on land until we're six years old. It's all swimming, wafting around. Standing up is hard at first, the weight distribution. Anyway, I, I went up dry side for the ceremony, and that was where I first met Sam. It was so loud and hot out there. All that shell blowing. I was bored, and my body felt dry and heavy. I was too young, really. There were souvenir stalls selling bracelets with little stones of polished lava. I wanted one so bad, I would not shut up about it. Sam saw I was fed up. They took me up the beach, away to the dunes, and Sam gave me a little polished stone of my own to play with. <laughs> Had a heart of gold, they did. It wasn't until years later that I found out it was a tiny replica of the one Aggie died on. We became good friends. Sam helped a lot. They were always on my side. My pod, we were quite traditional, didn't like us working with the dry ciders, but Sam talked me into going for the job as a diver on the new harbor. If it wasn't for them, I don't think I'd have tried. That stone was my lucky charm. I took it with me when I went for the interview, and I took it down with me when I went on my first dive. I had a pocket made specially in my tool belt. Sam took me under their fin, invited me out to the camel, and let me stay with them and blithe on the ferry if it was a late one. And there were plenty of late ones. Karaoke nights are still my favorites. Every time I feel that lucky stone in my pocket, I think of Sam. I remember all the fish folk coming up on the beach for Aggie's Day when I was a lad. Seems less of a big deal these days. I guess they still celebrate it, but, well, it's a lot more sedate. Back then, oh, it was a huge event. Oh, magic stones. I knew humans were superstitious, but I thought the fish folk would be a bit more savvy.
<laughs> Ooh, Sam, this is an easy scent profile. I'm coming, Sam. the sixth summer after I... Fire. Morris and Sparky! Oh, lovely to see you both. What can I do for you two? Well, we, we wanted to ask you something. Um, it's about Aggie. Hmm. She doesn't have long left now, does she? Poor thing. No, not long at all. We were hoping you might replace her as custodian. Oh, Morris. I spent years of my life as Harbour Master trying to keep people from meddling with nature. I don't feel any differently now. I'm appreciative of all Aggie has sacrificed for us, but the island spirit isn't evil. It just needs to erupt from time to time. And if it needs to now, let it, I say. Let nature do what it must. As the fish folk say, the tides will tell. Yeah. Yeah, Sam, I hear that. I really do. No! No, Morris. We can't just give up. Now, we'll talk about this in a bit, Sparky. Sam, it's always good to see you. Uh, will you be around later? I think I will. A volcanic eruption is a rare and beautiful thing. I think I'd like to see it. Okay, we just need to talk to Aggie. She'll know what to do. No, Sparky. I've been thinking about it. I think Samfire's right. I think it's maybe time to let the town go. No, Morris. 
It's not. No, it's all right, Sparky girl. It's over. This isn't my town anymore. The only ones around here who remember me are ghosts. That's not true. No, it is. But that's all right. Truly it is. Everything for a season and all that. And I miss the people I knew. The people who've moved on. I want to see them again. I think I will take Pete Noach up on his offer and head into the west with him. Shelmerston doesn't need Morris Lupton any longer. Morris Lupton, you will not give up. You have been granted a precious responsibility and you will honor it. Sparky? I'm... sorry about that. Remember when I told you I was mostly Sparky? I am, but... mostly. Then what else are you? I am the rock that you stand on. The wood you people built this town from. The magma bubbling beneath your feet. I am Selmiston. And right now I want to erupt. But I have also made connections to the things that live here. Connections I want to keep alive. I need you, Morris. Right. Well, uh... And I'm still your Sparky. And I need you, Morris. We all do. Oh, Sparky. I know you feel forgotten. I know you want to move on. I do too, but... But I can't until I wrap up this last bit of unfinished business. Will you... Will you try one last avenue with me? If we still can't find a solution, then... Then I'll be done. It'll all be done. And we can go into the West together. All right, Sparky. One last try. But who else is there to talk to? Aggie. Aggie? But where is she? I mean, she's everywhere, isn't she? She is. But I can sniff her out. I just need some mementos. But where would we find mementos from back then? Oh, of course. Back to your museum, Morris.